February 24, 1955, Stephen Paul Jobs was born to an unwed graduate student in San Francisco, California. One week later, a decision was made to put the baby up for adoption. The baby was actually named by his adoptive parents, Paul and Clara Jobs. Early schooling revealed Jobs to be a problem child, often bored with school routine. At an early age, Jobs found his interest in electronics fueled by rich opportunities that existed in the Bay Area, including an important exposure to Hewlett Packard. During high school, Jobs met the future co-founder of Apple Computer, Steve Wozniak, who at the time was working at Hewlett Packard. Out of respect for his birth mother's wishes, Jobs enrolled at Reed College in Portland, Oregon after finishing high school. He quickly realized his overwhelming interest in electronics and promptly dropped out of college after only one semester. He returned to the Bay Area to start a job as a technician at Atari Incorporated, riding the initial wave of enthusiasm for video gaming. Jobs and Wozniak regularly attended meetings of the Homebrew Computer Club, founded to make computers more accessible to everyone. Wozniak had created a computer for his own use and demonstrated its capabilities to the Homebrew Club members. While Wozniak only had the vision of a hobbyist, Jobs saw a business potential for Wozniak's handmade circuit board. Jobs convinced Wozniak to become his business partner, and Apple Computer was founded on April 1, 1976. Jobs felt that there was a market for an assembled computer, one that would allow users to go beyond hardware design in order to explore programming. This vision led to the birth of personal computing when the Apple II computer was released in 1977. The Apple II computer was a huge success for Jobs. During its production lifespan, over 2 million units were sold, and it became the standard for personal computing, particularly in the educational market. The Apple II was extremely popular in businesses after the 1979 introduction of VisiCalc, the first software spreadsheet program. In December of 1980, initial public offering of stock in Apple Computer made Steve Jobs a multi-millionaire. I was worth... Um about over a million dollars when I was 23, and over 10 million dollars when I was 24, and over 100 million dollars when I was 25. Um, and it's, it wasn't that important. In 1981, IBM entered the personal computing market and began to offer real competition for the Apple II. Jobs poured time and resources into the evolution of a graphical user interface pioneered by Xerox PARC. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this. The early manifestation of this effort was a computer called Lisa, a technical success but a sales flop. It did, however, serve as a forerunner of Macintosh. Apple's early successes required an experienced business figure to lead the company. Jobs himself handpicked Pepsi executive John Scully to lead Apple. And then he looked up at me and just stared at me with this stare that only Steve Jobs has. And he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? And I just gulped. While Scully ran the business, Jobs concentrated solely on the Macintosh project. Learning from mistakes made with the Lisa project, Apple and Jobs refined the user interface and created an affordable, compact, and stylish computer for the rest of us. Macintosh debuted on January 24, 1984, with a spectacular Super Bowl commercial and much fanfare. The commercial is viewed by many as the best television advertisement of all time. At a price of $2,500, the Macintosh was an affordable computer, although more expensive than the available IBM alternatives. The Macintosh's radically different graphical user interface and mouse met with some early success. Customers loved the interface, but the availability of software on the new platform was a critical issue, with many software companies preferring to write for the IBM computer market. Software availability quickly became a limiting factor for the Macintosh. By the beginning of 1985, Macintosh sales declined from the initial successes. It didn't do very much. We had Mac Paint and Mac Write uh, were our, our only applications. And the market started to figure this out. Um, by the end of the year, people said, well, maybe the uh, IBM PC isn't as easy to use or is not as attractive as the Macintosh 
but it actually does something which we want to be able to do, spreadsheets, word processing, and database. Internal power struggles at Apple eventually led to a decision from the board of directors to back Scully and his plans for the company. Jobs was so upset by these events that he sold all but one share of his Apple stock and eventually left the company. What can I say? I hired the wrong guy. That was Scully? Yeah. And uh, he destroyed everything I'd spent 10 years working for. From the triumph of a multi-million dollar stock offering and a dominant market share in personal computing, Jobs had to endure the tragedy of being fired from the very company that he had started 10 years before. Jobs said at the time, I feel like somebody just punched me in the stomach and knocked all my wind out. I'm only 30 years old and I want to have a chance to continue creating things. I know I've got at least one more great computer in me and Apple is not going to give me a chance to do that. After leaving Apple, Jobs pursued other interests both in computing and in graphical design. He purchased a digital imaging graphics group from Lucasfilm for $5 million and later renamed it Pixar. He also founded a computer company called Next and began to work on an advanced computer operating system with enhancements beyond any found on the Macintosh. In 1986, Pixar's primary product was a high-end computer system that had only a handful of customers. One of their customers, however, was Walt Disney Feature Animation. It was only after inking a $26 million deal with Disney for the production of a computer animated film that the company hit their stride. Jobs is quoted as saying of the Pixar film Toy Story, We believe it's the biggest advance in animation since Walt Disney started it all with the release of Snow White 50 years ago. Next Computer similarly had a small but influential customer base. Using the very stable Unix operating system as a foundation, Next created a computer environment that allowed users to easily create their own software programs. As a matter of fact, the original developer of the World Wide Web did so on a Next computer. Jobs emphasized elegance of design both for the software and the hardware it ran on. Although its expensive price tag limited its user base, it is important to realize that Jobs was actually designing the software that would eventually become the advanced OS X for a new age of Macintosh computers. By 1996, Apple's market share continued to decline, in part due to the lack of innovation during Jobs' absence. The success of Windows 95 had further eroded Apple's market share and emphasized the aging nature of the Macintosh operating system. Knowing that the Macintosh needed a complete overhaul of their current operating system, Apple considered four different candidates, Sun, BOS, Next, and even Microsoft. In the end, Apple made the decision to buy Next for over $400 million, and in the process, they brought Jobs back to Apple after an 11-year absence. Soon after returning to Apple, Steve Jobs was appointed CEO of the company. The advanced operating system acquired from Next became the new Mac OS X. Elegant but simple hardware designs followed, including the introduction of the iMac and iBook, plus various software packages, all carrying the i prefix, iMovie, iTunes, iPhoto, and others. Perhaps Jobs' greatest achievement in recent times has been the 2001 introduction of the iPod. It became a runaway success for Apple with over 67 million units sold and a current market share hovering around 70%. In recent years, the success of the iPod has even created a halo effect for Macintosh sales. Users happy with their iPods have proven more likely to consider a Macintosh when buying a computer. Some critics have suggested that Jobs has changed the focus of Apple Computer by branching out into digital media. Instead, it appears that the iPod project has ultimately provided support for the Macintosh. Steve Jobs and his life with Apple Computer exemplify early triumphs, an eventual tragedy, and ultimately a success story highlighted by an intense inner drive. From a startup company operating out of his garage, he built a company worth millions of dollars and literally created the home computer market. Driven by innovation and an insistence on excellence, Macintosh was born. In a boardroom maneuver, all was lost and his company was taken from him, but it languished without his guidance. Jobs never let up and continued to notch important successes while away from Apple. His triumphant return to Apple signaled a new beginning for the company and has launched it on an upward spiral of success.